Hello, and welcome back to the channel. For today's video, we're going to take a look at the engine of the Model T. So I've completely disassembled the engine of the Model T. So let's take a look at all the different parts. First, we have the engine block. This is the Model T engine block, four-cylinder. I think the displacement is roughly a little under two liters. So pretty small four-cylinder engine by modern standards. And only 20 horsepower out of an engine of this displacement, which is very poor by modern standards. But they say the Model T didn't get ridiculously bad gas mileage. Um, some of the things I was reading say they get something like between 15 and 20 miles per gallon. I don't know. We'll see what mine gets when I'm done with it. But not ridiculously bad gas mileage. But the biggest thing about these engines is they're really low uh, compression. The compression numbers on this are so low that with a little bit of tuning, you can get it to run on kerosene. So that's why they did it. The gas was so bad back then, they couldn't run it at any higher compression. It just wouldn't run with the type of gas that they had. So with the very poor gas of the day, these engines ran good with the low compression, low RPMs, just kind of lugged along with 20 horsepower, and it worked. So let's take a look at this. On the other side of the block here, we have the stamping number, which I think is kind of cool. The stamping number is located right here, sort of at a nice little plaque area. The number is 14,601,526. And that number is the engine block number, but it also is the number of engines since the first Model T engine. So the first Model T engine was stamped with zero, and then they just kept incrementing the numbers by one after that. So this Model T engine was built 14 million six hundred and some thousand engines after the first one. So I thought that was kind of cool. They built 15 million of these engines that specifically went into cars, and then they kept building them at a much lower production for some years after into the early 40s just for replacement engines and marine applications and some other things. So in total, they built like 15 million, 15 and a quarter million, something like that, of these engines. This number is 14 million and 600,000 some. So I thought that was kind of cool. I dated this number. It dated that to mid-December of 1926 when this engine was made, and then the car would have been assembled shortly thereafter. So that puts the car as a very early 1927 model. So starting with the first things I took off of the engine would have been the bearing caps on the pistons. So each of the rods have the bearing cap on the end. So you have to undo the castle nuts and cotter pins on each one of these, take off the bearing cap off the bottom, and then the cylinder and rod assembly slides up through the top of the engine. So I removed all four of those, and then I removed the three main bearing caps. So these, you have the first two main, and the third main is slightly bigger than the other two. So you can remove those and unbolt the transmission from the drive shaft, and then the drive shaft will lift off. So here's the drive shaft. On this side of it, we have a flange that mounts to the transmission. So there's just four bolts in the flange here that mount on the other side of the transmission, the side that's against the table. They mount four bolts in that to the transmission, and that's what provides power to it. Then you have your bearings and your rods. This is the gear for the timing, and this is for the crank, for the hand crank. So there's your, sh your um, crankshaft and your bearings. Now, now here's the third main bearing. These bearings are Babbitt bearings, which is very different than modern insert style bearings. So in modern insert bearings, you can just pop the bearing out of the mold or the casing, the outside piece, and then put a new one in. These, the bearing is actually cast into the outer cap. So if you need to redo these, you have to melt out this inside Babbitt material and pour new. So it's a much more time-consuming, intensive process to do that. So when I pulled these out, I thought this Babbitt was bad and it would have to be replaced. But Tom at Antique Auto Ranch said that these bearings are actually better than 95% of the ones he sees come into the shop. So I think they'll be okay. We can run them. They all had shims in them. So with these Babbitt bearings, they put these little shims in with them when they cast them along the, where the bolts mount. They mount these. They'll mount a couple of them stacked up. And then as the bearings wear, you can take them off and take one of these shims out and then clamp it back, and that'll tighten up the tolerances on them. So most of the bearings had one of these shims still left in it.
So I can just run them all without shims and they should be okay. I will have to check the clearances with a plastic gauge, but we should be able to make these work with or without a shim. So I'm gonna be working on that as well. So that's the bearing situation. The pistons are all good. I'm just gonna get new rings for them, hone the cylinders, new piston rings, and reuse that as it sits. Valves, I pulled out all eight of the valves. There are two valves per cylinder inlet and exhaust. These valves are the original two-piece type. So they have two pieces, a hardened steel uh, shaft and a cast head. So I did it that way, I guess, because it was cheaper to make in two pieces rather than trying to make them as one. I'm not entirely certain the thought behind that. But anyway, they were two pieces. So they worked well originally, but now these being close to 100 years old, it is a good idea to get new ones because the two-piece joint is right here, and this head can pop off the stem and completely ruin your engine. That will be a very expensive fix. If that pop pops off, at the very least, it'll ruin the cylinders and you'll have to get it machined. But that, that could very easily be a very expensive repair. So I'm going to be replacing all eight of the valves with some new one-piece valves. And they seem to be seating okay. I think I can do standard size. They are standard size now. They seem to be, they look like they're seating good, so I'm probably just going to do a new set of standard size and not worry about machining out the valve seats. Now these don't have hardened valve seats, they're just machined into the block itself. So if you want to fix the valve seats, you have to rebore this and then put in an insert seat that'll be the correct size. So I don't want to do that if I don't have to, and I think they're okay, and I'm not going to do that. So I think that pretty much is the condition of the engine as it is. I have lightly cleaned up the outside of this with my wire brush. I have some more cleaning to do on this. I've got to get around the little nooks and crannies on it. And then I'm going to paint this. So Model T engine paint is kind of a big subject. There was very little evidence of what was painted and what wasn't. Most of the earlier cars were not painted engines. They didn't paint them. They were just left alone. This car, I believe, was painted. I couldn't find any evidence of it on the block, but starting in 26 and 7, they started painting the engines dark green. Here's the can of engine green that I got. This is the same color, antique Ford green, that was used on Ford's engines from 1927 to 1941. So I'm going to be using this to paint the engine. I think that's going to look really cool. So I have finished cleaning up the engine block and painted it. So this is the antique Ford engine green that is recommended for this year of Model T. It's kind of a greenish, bluish gray. It's really a unique color. I really like it. So I've painted the block. So for the game plan going forward, I am first going to hone the cylinders. So the cylinders need to be honed with a crosshatch pattern to be able to accept the new piston rings and get a good seal. So I'm going to hone them first. Then I'm going to fix the third main bearing, and I'll explain that in my next video, what exactly I need to do to it. But I'm going to work on that, the thrust surface on it, and get the crank set. Then I'm going to install the cylinders, the pistons, and the rods, get all of that working, and the rod bearings. Then I'm going to put this block in the car while there's nothing else attached to it, while it'll be lighter. So I'm going to put this straight in the car then, then I'm going to install the valves and the head, head gasket, and wrap up the actual engine itself and start working on the accessories. So that's sort of my game plan for right now. So for honing the cylinder, I have purchased a three-armed stone cylinder hone. Now there are two different styles available. There is this three-pronged style, and then there also is the flex hone or berry bush style. Now a couple differences. This hone can be used for any diameter of cylinders. The flex hone can only be used for a certain diameter. But the flex hone is easier to use and it's, it's not as uh, finicky as this one. So the flex hone was originally recommended to me to be used for this project. But the local parts store didn't have one in stock. They had this so I decided to give it a try. Now the man at the parts store gave me a little bit of advice about this. He said specifically that these are easy to use if you f use them right. So when you're using it in the cylinder, you don't want to extend the hones 
beyond about a half inch on each side of the cylinders. When you're pulling it up and when you're putting it down, you only want to just barely overlap the ends of the cylinders. You don't want to push it any further than that because these arms are going to spring out and break your stones. So that's probably the biggest issue with these is they're a little bit harder to use in that respect. But the key to both this and the flex hone is that you just have to go slow. You have to use a variable speed drill and just go really slow. Because what you're aiming for is a 45 degree cross hatch on the inside of the cylinder walls. So basically the velocity on the outside of the hone needs to be the same as the speed that you're moving up and down. That will create the 45 degree slope that we're looking for. So if this is going too fast, you can't match that going up and down. So you want to be sure this is going really slow so that you'll be able to keep up with it and actually create that 45 degree cross hatch. So if you're going slow, there's really nothing that can go wrong with this as long as you don't pull it too far or push it too far in. So I'm going to give it a try. The first thing when you're using this, as with any hone, you have to use oil. So some people say that you can use almost any kind of oil, cutting fluid, tapping fluid, any kind of oil really. They say motor oil works really well, so that's what I'm going to be using, 30 weight motor oil. So you want to be sure to oil the stones and the inside of the cylinder walls so that everything is lubricated. Then you need to actually hone the cylinder, and the key to that is, as I said before, a really slow drill speed and don't go too long. They say 30 seconds is about max, 30 to 40 seconds. So I'm going to go real slow and check it a couple times, about 10 seconds or so, and not take off any more than you have to. You just want to take off the glazing on the cylinder walls and try to get a little bit of cross hatching. But if you go too long, you're going to take off too much material and your pistons aren't going to fit and you're going to have a lot of problems. So you don't want to take off too much material, so it's just best to go slow and keep checking it. Because really all this is supposed to do is take off the glazing on the cylinder walls so that you have a nice tight fit for the cylinder rings. So let's get started. So now I have removed the original piston rings that were on these pistons, cleaned up the pistons, and cleaned up the grooves. So when you remove the old rings, you have to be sure to clean out all of the grease and gunk that is in the ring grooves here so that your new rings will be able to seat nicely in the pistons. So I have my new rings set out here. Now each ring manufacturer is going to have its own set of instructions on the order and the direction to install your rings. On these rings you have your oil ring that goes on the bottom here. And this is slightly different than the oil ring that is on it but the same general principle. So this ring goes on the bottom groove and then you have the next ring which is your first compression ring. And these rings have a specific direction. They have a groove on one side and a taper. So some rings will give you a diagram showing which way is up. These specific rings have the word top written in them so you know that goes to the top of the cylinder and the top of the piston. So that is the direction to place these rings. When you put these rings on you have to be really careful to put them on straight and carefully open them up straight, slide them over and put them on straight. If you do them crooked and here let me grab an old one here's one of the old rings. If you put them on crooked and kind of twist them like that you're gonna spring your ring and it's gonna stay in that shape it's not gonna line up perfectly straight and that's not a good thing. So you don't want to, want to twist them sideways at all like that. You just want to open them straight and slide them on straight. And they have special tools that will help you put that on. A ring tool that will open them up and you can just slide them right on and clip it. I don't have a ring tool. I'm just going to be doing it without that for these pistons. If you had, especially if you had an eight cylinder, it would be a pain to do all of these. Three rings per cylinder, eight cylinders, that's a lot of rings. It would be a pain if you didn't have the tool. For this car, I'm not going to use it because I don't have the tool and there's not as many. So you just got to be sure that you put them on the right direction in the right order and don't spring them. So we have already checked these rings to make sure they have the proper end clearance in the cylinder. So now it's time to install them on the post piston itself. Well, that concludes our look at the bearings and pistons of the Model T engine. The engine's starting to get put back together, and I'll have a video up in the future about the assembly of the engine. But for now, if you liked this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up at the bottom of the video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and leave me a comment if you have any questions or concerns. As always, thank you for watching. Turn on the radio and let's have some music.
Why, even you look bright this morning.